Hello, everyone. Welcome to, um, I think this is the fourth annual State of Economy talk sponsored by the JPDI Research Institute. Um, I am the director, current director of the Institute. I'm here to introduce Professor Giorgio Primisari to you. Uh, before I introduce Professor Giorgio Primisari, I want to get a couple of housekeeping items out of the way. First is, uh, so this talk um, usually uh, is uninterrupted. So you keep your questions until the end, but at any time of your talk, you can submit your question to the pigeonhole app, which you can find by scanning this QR code. I think everyone will have, everyone already has this piece of paper, right? Um, so you scan this, you submit your question uh, on that website. And Chris over there will get your question. He's gonna screen them and he's gonna ask the questions to the speaker at the end of the talk, okay? Uh, so that's first. And second, after the talk, there will be a reception right over there. Everyone is invited uh, to stay around and talk to the speaker and talk to the econ faculty members, okay? All right. So Professor Giorgio Primisari is a highly regarded economist and professor at Northwestern University. He grew up in a small town in Southern Italy, which he told me just now. <laughs> he graduated uh, summa cum laude from Bocconi University in 1998 before he earned his PhD in economics at Princeton University in 2004. So he joined Northwestern University in 2004 and has been there ever since. In addition to his appointment, appointment at the Northwestern University, Professor Primisari also serves as the co-editor of the American Economic Journal, Macroeconomics um, uh, Journal, uh, one of the top journals in macroeconomics. He is also a longtime consultant at the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States and the European Central Bank. So just a couple hours ago, he told me that a very interesting phenomenon about how inflation was so similar, almost identical between the US and Europe. Now you know why. <laughs> um, anyways, so Professor Primisari is well known for his work on inflation and business cycle. He's an expert on how the effects of monetary policy on inflation and on economic output evolve over time and especially how these effects change around historical events. His expertise is uh, particularly relevant now because we just put a global pandemic behind us and is now experiencing uh, this long lasting impact on the economy and on our society. So hardly anyone is more, um, is in a better position than Professor Premiseri to enlighten us about the new state of economy. So the floor is yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Um, so, um, and thank you very much for inviting me to give this uh, talk hosted by the Julie Plant Granger Institute. Uh, um, as you probably know, inflation has dominated the news over the last uh, two or three years, not just the news, also the policy discussion. And there's a very simple reason because uh, inflation hit a record high, a 40 year record high actually, uh, of about 10 percentage points uh, on a year on year basis. Uh, the last time we had seen this level of inflation was during the early 1980s uh, in the United States. And inflation has grown so much, not just in the United States, but also in other parts of the world, including the Euro area. And so today I would like to uh, focus this talk and tell you a little bit about uh, this recent uh, run up of inflation, possibly getting at the bottom of its drivers. Uh, and I also would like to talk about some of the difficult trade-offs uh, that the Federal Reserve 
and the European Central Bank have faced uh, or are still facing. Uh, um, this is uh, this is joint work with a long-term co-author, Domenico Giannone. Actually, this paper was uh, originally prepared and presented uh, at the ECB Forum on Central Banking last July, held in Portugal. This is the European equivalent of the Jackson Hole Conference. Uh, the reason I mentioned this is because originally the paper was very much Euro area centric. Uh, but this talk today has given us a very nice opportunity to redo some of these things for the US. And so I'm gonna present something um, uh, about the US uh, and the comparison with the Euro area um, today, okay? So I plan to... Okay. Um, I would like to organize this presentation around the following four questions. First, I would like to know to what extent the recent behavior of inflation was similar when we compare the United States and the Euro area. Second, what has caused the recent surge in inflation in both of these economies? Third, what if the ECB and the Federal Reserve had tried to keep inflation closer to their official or unofficial 2% target? What would have happened to the rest of the economy? And finally, the fourth question is about the current outlook for monetary policy and inflation going forward, both in the Euro area and in the United States. So before we get to the core of the presentation, I would like to give you a preview of the answers to these questions. So as far as the first question goes, whether the behavior of inflation was similar in the US and the Euro area? The answer is a very strong yes. In fact, not only the behavior of headline inflation, the overall measure of inflation was nearly identical when we compare the United States and the Euro area, but also many of the inflation components like goods, services, energy, behave very much the same. Um, so given the similarity in the evolution, this part of the presentation will be basically about showing you some data and setting the stage. Then to ask the question about what caused the run up of inflation. And so given the answer to the first question that inflation has behaved very much alike in these two economies, you might not be surprised to hear that according to our results, also the drivers of inflation has been relatively similar in the US and the Euro area. And in fact, what we find is that in both regions, inflation has been predominantly driven by unexpectedly strong aggregate demand that takes different forms. And I will try to clarify that uh, uh, later on. So demand has been driving inflation not, for example, the supply chain bottlenecks uh, or the rapid rise in energy prices, which is the other uh, popular explanation for the run-up of inflation. To be clear, you know, we don't deny, we do find that adverse supply shocks uh, hit both economies, the United States and the Euro area during COVID and after COVID. But what we document uh, is that most of the effect of these adverse uh, supply conditions can be seen in economic activity and much less on in inflation that is instead mainly demand driven. So the third question is, all right, I understand that demand uh, drove inflation, but what would have happened if the central banks uh, in both of these regions had tried to counteract, to neutralize these demand forces uh, that uh, uh, pushed inflation high. And what we show there is that probably it wouldn't have been a great idea because this would have created a, a severe output loss, hampering substantially the recovery after COVID in both regions. Fourth question, what about looking forward? What, what's gonna happen, you know, uh, in the future, of course, it's difficult to tell, but based on some simulations of, uh, uh, based on our model, we have actually a pretty optimistic outlook for the future in both areas, both in the US uh, and in the Euro area, and both in the short run 
and in the long run. In the short run, because the model predicts a relatively smooth path back to 2% inflation, which is widely recognized as the target, as the inflation target of the ECB and the Federal Reserve. So that's good, but that's not particularly surprising because inflation is already almost there. Inflation in the US and inflation in the Euro area is slightly above two, 2.5. I don't remember the exact number. The model predicts that it's gonna go back to five smooth, uh, to 2% 2 smoothly. But most important, the, 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 the nice result here and more important result is that the outlook is good when we look at the long run. And the reason, is that we document that even though both the Fed and the ECB have experienced or have let inflation increase to levels that we hadn't seen in 40 years, neither of these two central banks seem to have lost any credibility in the sense that the public right now expects monetary policy conducted by the Fed and the ECB to be back to the pre-COVID standards. And this is good news because up until 2019, both central banks had done an excellent job in keeping inflation closer to the target and under control. Okay, so this is the roadmap. And now I'm gonna expand on each of these questions one at a time, starting with the first one. That's strange. Wasn't supposed to happen. Um, okay, forget about this. <laughs> Let's focus on the first question. To what extent the inflation, the recent evolution of inflation has been similar in the Euro area and in the United States? Uh, and in general, to what extent their economic experiences have been similar since the onset of the pandemic? And actually I want to start with by documenting something that was not that similar, which is the behavior of economic activity, okay? So this graph plots the behavior of GDP starting in 2018, both in the United States on the left. Whenever you see something blue, that refers to the United States. Whenever you see something red, that refers to the Euro area. So this plots the log level of GDP in both regions since 2018, and both of them have been normalized to be zero in the last quarter of 2019. And what the, the dashed and dotted lines in both graphs represent uh, uh, the Fed, the ECB, and the survey of professional forecasters pre-COVID forecast about GDP. So this is essentially what the, I don't remember. Which, um, the, the dotted line is uh, the survey of professional forecasters, the dashed line are the forecast of the Fed. This is what the Fed in the last quarter of 2019 expected GDP to evolve over the following three or four years. Obviously GDP was much lower than that because at that point, COVID was not predictable. Instead, COVID hit both economies. There was a super severe recession in which GDP fell by almost 10 percentage points and then gradually recovered in the US, more or less to the old trend or to the old best guess about where GDP would have been um, in this period. Now, the first thing that we notice is that the recession was much more severe in the Euro area relative to the US. And perhaps more importantly, the recovery was lower. So slower that actually, um, the Euro era GDP has not recovered to the old uh, uh, forecast or to the old trend, okay? So this is a difference. Um, there was a worse recession and a slower recovery in the Euro area relative to the US. Let's keep this in mind and let's move on to measures of prices now. So this is a measure of quantity, by the way, if you plot alternative measures of quantities like consumption, you would see almost exactly the same. Let's turn to prices. And I wanna start with the energy prices. The reason why energy prices are important is because energy prices have increased dramatically right after 
COVID starting in 2021. And one of the reasons why they have increased a lot, especially in 2022, and especially in Europe, has been the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so there has been a lot of talking about the influence of this rapid increase of energy prices in driving inflation. Okay, so let's take a look at energy prices and energy inflation more generally. Before showing you the overall inflation in, uh, in energy, I want to show you two main components of energy, which are household energy and transportation energy. So let me, let me explain what these graphs are. On the left-hand side, we have household energy, in the inflation rate for household energy. And on the right-hand side, we have the inflation rate for transportation energy. The red line corresponds to the Euro area. The blue line corresponds to the US. So what is household energy? This is uh, energy used for household utilities, essentially electricity and gas. And as you can see, the inflation rate, so the rate at which the price of electricity and gas has increased in the Euro area has been much faster than in the US because the Euro area was much more exposed, or this is the typical narrative, much more exposed to the Ukrainian war and to the uh, increase in gas prices due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. On the other hand, what about transportation energy? Transportation energy is essentially um, gasoline, motor fuels, so gasoline essentially. And here you can see that we experience the opposite. The price of gasoline has increased much more rapidly in the US or more rapidly in the US relative to Europe. So here we have two different messages. Inflation for household energy was faster in the US and uh, uh, in, the, in Europe and inflation for transportation energy was higher in the US. Now I'm gonna put them together to form an aggregate measure of energy inflation, which we have here at the bottom and kind of magically, but perhaps not particularly surprisingly, when you put these two things together, the behavior of energy prices and energy inflation was rather similar in, uh, um, in the US and in the Euro area, despite the fact that many um, uh, policymakers or, or, or media outlets remark the extremely strong exposure of Europe to the increase in energy prices. This doesn't seem to be True. Yes, perhaps a little bit here. Inflation peaked a little bit higher and a little bit uh, later in Europe relative to the, to the US, but this doesn't seem to be a dramatic difference. So overall, I will conclude that the behavior of energy prices, uh, especially when we look at the aggregate, uh, was broadly similar in these two regions. So now I want to move on to broader measures uh, of inflation starting with headline inflation, the broader overall inflation, okay? Which I plot in this left panel. Let me explain what this is. As usual, the red line refers to headline inflation in Europe and the blue line to headline inflation in the US. For Europe, we computed inflation using the so-called HICP, which is the Harmonized Index of Consumer Prices, which is the most widely measure of prices or index of prices in uh, mo most widely used in, uh, in Europe. For the US, we use the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which is the most comparable measure of prices uh, in the United States. But we needed to do another adjustment. This, is, uh, this might sound boring, but it makes a difference. Uh, the standard CPI measure in the US includes an imputation for rents for owner-occupied houses. So if you live in your own house and you don't actually pay any rent, but the statistical agency, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, imputes the rent that you would pay to yourself and uses that in the computation of this aggregate index of prices. In Europe, they don't do that. And so in order to compare, and that's a pretty large 
component of the CPI basket. So in order to compare these two measures of prices, we needed to um, take out from the CPI the imputed rent for owner-occupied houses. Once you do that, perhaps magically, inflation in the US and inflation in Europe are nearly identical, except for this six month delay with which inflation peaked in Europe relative to the US. Now let's move on to an alternative measure of inflation, which is inflation excluding energy. Sometimes this is, this is related to the concept of uh, core inflation that you might have heard. It's not exactly core inflation because core inflation also excludes the price of food. But not surprisingly, given that I showed you before that the price of energy or energy inflation was very similar in the two regions, and overall inflation is very similar in the two regions, inflation excluding energy is also fairly similar in the two regions, except for the usual delay with which inflation has peaked in the euro area relative to the US. Um, so the conclusion here is that inflation really behaved nearly identically in the Euro area and the United States. And to provide further evidence of this, I'm gonna show you inflation for goods and services separately. Now, this is important because I don't know if you remember, during the pandemic, uh, in the first quarter of the pandemic, so the first quarter of 2020, all of us cut our spending for every type of consumption. But then starting in the second quarter of uh, 2020, we realized that we could not consume services. We could not go to the restaurant. I could not go to get a haircut. I should go now, but uh, now I can. Um, so we could not consume services. It was dangerous. So services were not provided uh, because uh, um, uh, waitresses and waiters cannot go to work, et cetera, et cetera. And so most of us redirected our spending towards goods. We bought new chairs, we bought new couches, uh, new computers. Uh, and so the price of goods uh, started to increase much earlier. The price of services also started to increase, but much later when all of us could go back to spending in services. So inflation for goods and inflation for services be, has behaved quite differently in the United States. Is that the same in Europe? Yes, absolutely. Very much the same. In Europe also, in, uh, inflation for goods picked up much earlier and inflation for services pick up, picked up much later. And as usual, these two lines are just phase shifted. They are almost identical, but phase shifted. So this is another um, uh, point of evidence that inflation really behaved very much alike in the, uh, in the Euro area and the United States. So we do have an answer to the first question, which is, did inflation evolve uh, in a similar way in the United States and Europe? Yes, very much so. Actually, nearly identically. So, now we're gonna move on to the second question, which is about the drivers of inflation. Let's go back to the graph of overall inflation. As you can see here, inflation went from, you know, values closer to 2% to about 10% in 2022. And so naturally, most economists and policymakers have asked what has driven inflation so high? Now, from the point of view of policy, it's very important uh, to determine whether inflation was driven high by demand or supply shocks. And there is a very important policy reason. And the reason is the following. Um, the conventional view, but also the standard uh, monetary model suggests that central banks should react very vigorously to demand shocks. So if all of us want to spend more suddenly, for whatever reason, or if the government decides to spend more by increasing government spending, this is going to put upward pressure on prices 
and it's gonna drive up economic activity. So there's a positive correlation between quantities and prices. Typically that's inefficient. And the standard recommendation coming out from monetary models is that uh, central banks should cool down demand by increasing interest rates to keep economic activity at potential and prices stable or inflation more or less at the target. However, if the economy is hit by a supply shock, that's not the case anymore. And central banks should be much more careful. The typical expression that is used in central banks is central banks should look through supply shocks, especially if the shocks are temporary. And the reason is the following. Supply shocks are shocks that drive a negative co-movement between prices and quantities. So a negative supply shock driven, for example, by the increase in energy prices uh, would uh, increase the overall price level. So inflation would go up, but economic activity would suffer and would generate a recession. So at that point, there is a trade-off for central bank because central banks dislike this rapid increase of prices, but they also dislike. And so on the one hand, they would like to cool down the economy, but on the other hand, the economy is already in a recession and therefore they face this trade off. And so the typical response, especially if you expect this shock to be temporary, is to wait, not to do much, to accommodate that shock. And so determining whether uh, inflation was driven up by demand or supply, is important for policy because you might want to interpret that as a policy mistake. If that was driven by demand, that, that could be a policy mistake. And if it could, if it was driven by supply, it simply meant that central banks were accommodating, were looking through the supply shock. So this is what we try to do. We try to determine whether the increase in inflation experience since uh, early 2021 in the US and in the Euro area was mainly due to unexpectedly strong demand or unexpectedly weak supply. And there are plenty of reasons to believe that both of these components are important. For example, there is plenty of talking about the fact that uh, uh, during COVID or right after COVID, there were a lot of uh, supply chain bottlenecks that reduce the ability of the world economy to supply goods. Similarly, uh, COVID created, uh, um, people couldn't really go to work during COVID and right after COVID. So also the supply of services suffered. On the other hand, during COVID, fiscal policy in the US, but also in Europe, intervened very aggressively, stimulating demand. Similarly, right after COVID, after all of us uh, um, decided that it was safe to go back to our old life, we probably had a little bit of a higher desire to spend regular, uh, relative to a normal period. So probably we spent a little bit more, especially given that during COVID we saved a bunch of money because we couldn't spend in services. Um, and monetary policy might have created... Uh, strong demand by not reacting enough to inflation. Okay, so there are plenty of reasons to believe that both of these explanations could be valid. And so we wanted to use a statistical model to see whether a statistical model can point us towards one explanation that is more likely to be true than the other. And the way we did it was, uh, for those of you who are macroeconomists, we use a technique called the uh, structure of VAR. For those of you who are not macroeconomists, this is a multivariate statistical model of the joint evolution of prices and quantities, some of the series that I showed you in the earlier graphs. And within this joint statistical model, we identify demand and supply shocks as shocks that either move quantities and prices in the same direction, this is the typical demand shock, or move quantities and prices in opposite directions. Okay, and so this model is able to decompose in this graph. Let me explain what this is. 
On the left-hand side, we have the US, GDP in the US and the inflation level in the US. This corresponds, GDP, the actual data are the blue dotted lines. So this is inflation going up to 10%. This is GDP, the recession of uh, during COVID and the recovery. On the right-hand side, we have the same for the Euro area, GDP and inflation. The dashed dotted line in all of these graphs represents as usual, the pre-COVID forecast. This is what we would have expected to these variables to happen when we didn't know that COVID would hit. For example, the best guess about the behavior of inflation before COVID was inflation being close to 2%, which is what central banks had been doing for the previous 20 or 30 years, okay? But obviously in practice, COVID actually hit, unfortunately, and drove the large recession that I showed you in the earlier graphs and inflation being higher than the target that I showed you in the earlier graphs. Now, what the model that I mentioned before is able to, to do is to decompose the forecast error, the extent to which the actual data have been different from we, what we expected before COVID into a demand and a supply component. The demand component are the yellow bars and the supply component are the green bars. And what do we see from this graph? The first thing that we see is that adverse supply conditions, those that I mentioned before, the, bot, the, the, bot, um, the supply chain bottlenecks, uh, the increase in energy prices, all of those adverse supply shocks, uh, they did constrain economic activity. They were important to explain why GDP suffered and economic activity in general suffered substantially during and after COVID. So this is this negative contribution to GDP here. On the other hand, the effect of supply, the green bars or inflation was relatively limited. And most of the uh, increase in inflation, according to this decomposition, is due to demand factors. Again, what are these demand factors? The fact that governments intervene very aggressively uh, with expansionary fiscal policy. For instance, in the United States, both the Trump and Biden administration transfer money to households. In Europe, something similar happened. It has a slightly different uh, uh, form and shape, but something similar. So governments responded to COVID for a reason. Huh? They responded to COVID very aggressively. Another source of this unexpectedly strong demand driving up inflation was pent-up demand. The type of pent-up demand I referred to before, after being closed uh, in our house for 18 months, at some point we could go back to our normal life and we probably spend more than what we would have done otherwise. And again, another possible contributor of this uh, strong impact of demand forces on inflation could be the fact that the Fed and the ECB might have been very accommodating. Okay, and I'm gonna um, say a little bit more about this uh, in a second. All right, so let me put this a little bit into context now, because this result has been obtained with a very simple model with just two variables, prices and quantities, inflation and GDP. But this is a very robust result. You can introduce a bunch of variables in the model that um, according to conventional view are important, like for instance, energy prices. You could put energy prices there and you would get exactly the same result. You could put interest rates. You could distinguish between goods and services. Uh, you could distinguish between household energy and transportation energy, like some of the data that I showed you before. This is a very robust result. So what makes it interesting, well, what makes it interesting to me <laughs> is that uh, it is somewhat surprising. At least Domenico and I were very surprised when we first obtained this result because concluding that inflation was predominantly demand driven goes against the popular narrative, especially for Europe, in which uh, um, the popular narrative according to which 
inflation, especially in Europe, was mostly due to adverse supply conditions, including the effect of the Ukrainian war on energy prices. Um, and so one thing that we wanted to do is to check whether this result was just very much specific to the type of statistical model that we were using, or there was more of an economic rationale for it. And so I'm gonna spend the next maybe five minutes by moving some curves. I wanna analyze the plausibility of this result with the simplest possible demand and supply econ 101 type of uh, uh, diagram, okay? And I'm gonna do it here. So let me show you what this represents. We're gonna have inflation on the vertical axis and GDP in deviations from trend on the horizontal axis. This, is, this, this graph is specific to the Euro area economy, but if you change EA with US, you will get almost exactly the same. So this is the position of the Euro area economy in the last quarter of 2019, when output was more or less equal to its uh, long run trend, potent, call it potential output, and inflation was approximately equal to 2%. So the economy was under control at that point. Now, this is the position of the Euro area economy instead at the end of 2022, when output was still below trend and inflation had reached a record high of 10%. So our economic model, whatever that is, needs to explain how we could move from here to here, okay? I'm gonna use a very simple demand and supply. The first thing I'm gonna draw is the supply curve. As you all know, the supply curve is positively sloped. This is, these are prices and these are quantities. The supply curve is positively sloped. And so I'm conjecturing that in 2019, the supply curve was positioned here. It has to cross the realization of the data in 2019. And then I am conjecturing that between 2019 and 2022, the supply curve must have shifted to the left. And this is perfectly in line with the conventional view that in those years, both economies, the Euro area here, but also the US suffer from these adverse supply conditions that made supply contract and move to the left. Okay, so this must be true according to this uh, to the data that we have observed. But now, the ability of this shift in supply, this contraction in supply, to explain the inflation experience, to explain why inflation went up from two to 10%, depends entirely in this graph on the slope of the aggregate demand. If the aggregate demand is very flat, a shift in the aggregate supply is going to have a very large effect on output, but a limited effect on inflation. Okay, so let me analyze two extreme cases. The first case, well, actually, before analyzing the extreme cases, we need to know one important thing. The slope of the aggregate demand is endogenous to monetary policy. Think about it. The more aggressively a central bank reacts to inflation, the less a central bank is willing to tolerate inflation deviations from the 2% target, the flatter is gonna be the aggregate demand. In the extreme case, suppose that we have a central bank that is a strict inflation targeter. Like this is a central, this is not the case for the Federal Reserve, it's not the case for the European Central Bank. This is an extreme uh, case for illustrative purposes. Suppose that this is a central bank that is not willing to tolerate any deviation of inflation from 2%. In that case, the aggregate demand curve in this economy would be entirely flat. Therefore, 
the shift in supply, the contraction in supply, would have a very large effect on output, creating a massive recession, but the effect on inflation would be zero. Inflation would still be at 2%. And in this type of situation, for inflation to rise at the level of 10%, you will need a shift in the aggregate demand. Otherwise, you will never absorb 10%. And in that type of world, again, in extreme case, inflation will be entirely demand-driven. In other words, if you told me that the Fed is a strict inflation target, which is not, but if you told me that it is, I would not need to estimate any statistical model. I could immediately give you the answer that in that world, the only reason why you might deviate from two is because the central bank has decided to tolerate the deviation from two. And so this is demand. The central bank may be more accommodative than usual. Now, let's look at the opposite extreme of a central bank that doesn't care much about inflation, that does not raise interest rates when inflation goes up, as a very, very weak reaction to inflation. In that situation, the aggregate demand curve would be almost vertical. And in that situation, inflation, the rise of inflation from 2 to 10%, would be entirely supply driven. Okay? So now, to answer the question about whether the increase in inflation in the US and in the euro area from 2 to 10% is mostly due to demand or to supply, effectively, it's the same as asking whether the aggregate demand curve in those economies is relatively flat or relatively vertical. But if you think about it, it's got to be flat. Because if you look at the experience of the Fed and the ECB over the last 30 years, both of them have established an excellent, and luckily so, an excellent reputation as inflation fighters. They are not strict inflation targeters, but they're pretty good inflation targeters. And therefore, you should not be surprised when I tell you that the estimate, according to our model, of the slope of the aggregate demand is this one in both of these economies, approximately the same. And in this case, you know, only this limited fraction of the increase in inflation would be supply driven, and the rest has to be demand driven. Okay. Um, and so this explains essentially the result that inflation, the driver of inflation, is predominantly demand. Um, how much time do I have? Oh, I'm gonna keep over this. I see, these are the old slides. Okay. Um, okay, so let me turn now turn to the third question, which is, all right, inflation has increased, but what would have happened if the Federal Reserve and the ECB had tried harder to keep inflation under control by raising interest rates, essentially? Okay, they were very slow in raising interest rates, both the Fed and the ECB. And in order to answer this question, we're gonna augment our model with a measure of interest rates. So we're gonna add a third variable and we're gonna do some counterfactual exercises. So we're going to simulate based on our model, the details are not important, but we're going to simulate how the US economy would have behaved if the Fed had started to increase interest rates earlier instead of waiting. This is the first simulation that I'm gonna show you, tied in earlier. The second simulation I'm gonna show you is, actually I'm gonna skip the second one and focus on the third. So what would have happened if the Fed had kept inflation at 2% and implemented the strict inflation targeting uh, rule of reacting incredibly aggressively to inflation to keep it at 2%, okay? So these are the results of this uh, um, 
of the simulation, where the dotted blue line are the actual data. Now I'm starting in the middle of 2021 when inflation started to increase. Uh, this is the pre-COVID trend as usual, the pre-COVID forecast. And the uh, so this is GDP in the US, G CPI inflation and the interest rate. And the olive lines here are the counterfactual simulations. So in this counterfactual simulation, the Fed starts to increase the interest rate earlier than they actually did. Not by more. At the end, they end up with the same interest rate, but they start increasing earlier. What would have happened? Well, inflation would have increased less, especially at the beginning, because they tied in earlier. But GDP would have suffered a little bit more. Not surprisingly, in this counterfactual, the Fed is implementing contractionary monetary policy earlier. Therefore, prices are increasing less and economic activity is declining relative to what actually happened, okay? So whether this is a good outcome or a bad outcome in this counterfactual world, it depends on you know, the preferences of uh, versus economic activity versus inflation. The second counterfactual, which is number three in my previous list instead, is a strict inflation targeting counterfactual in which we are simulating what would have happened if the Fed had kept inflation at 2%. This is obviously a very extreme counterfactual because it's not obvious that they would have wanted to keep inflation at 2%. And more importantly, it's not obvious that they would have been able in the real world making policy in real time to keep inflation at 2%, okay? So this is something that you can do in a model to get a sense uh, of this benchmark uh, of the orders of magnitude, but most likely this is not implementable in reality. Still, it's interesting. So let's look at this. So this is the counterfactual path of inflation. The Fed now has managed to keep inflation at 2% throughout this period. The only way in which they could have done this is by increasing interest rates earlier relative to what they actually did and by quite a bit more. And not surprisingly, this would have created a substantial slowdown in economic activity with GDP being lower in this counterfactual world than what actually happened. By the way, you get very similar results for the Euro area, okay? Let me skip that over. Let me go to the fourth question, which is, okay, what should we expect now? Are the problem over? Not only that. Did the Fed and the ECB lose some credibility by letting inflation increase uh, um, to this level of 10% that we hadn't seen in 40 years? And um, in order to answer this question, we took our little statistical model and we simply projected it forward. Okay, we, did, we computed forecasts based on this model. These are the actual realization of the data that I showed you before. This is GDP in the US. This is the CPI inflation in the US. This is the behavior of interest rates in the US. And this is what our model predicts of what we should expect going forward. So the main thing to focus on here, or one thing to focus on, is that the model predicts, perhaps not surprisingly, given that inflation is already uh, at three or slightly less than three, the model predicts a relatively smooth path back to the inflation target of 2%. So the model suggests that in the short run, there's not much we should worry about. Inflation is gonna go back to 2%. And actually given that inflation is in check, the model also predicts that the Fed should start easing. The Fed should start reducing interest rates, which is actually what they started to do. So from that point of view, the model is fairly consistent with, uh, uh, with reality. But the most important thing here is about the long run, is about the question about whether central banks uh, like the Fed and the ECB have lost some credibility by letting inflation rise to 
And the way we answer this question, whether they do or they don't, they whether they have or they have not lost credibility is by comparing the forecast generated by our model to the forecast of the professional forecasters, which are represented by the green dots, okay? And uh, what you should notice here is that the forecast of the model and the forecast of the professional forecasters are fairly similar. So this is both reassuring and remarkable. It's reassuring because, you know, the fact that our little model gives very similar forecast uh, to these professional forecasters, then that's good. I'm happy with that. It's remarkable because our little model does not use any information about the professional forecasters, about the, for the survey of professional forecasters, okay? But more important, this result is informative for the following reason. Our model has been estimated using data up until the end of 2019. So the forecast produced by our model incorporate the conduct of monetary policy of the Fed up until the end of 2019. The fact that the professional forecasters have almost exactly the same forecast as our model means that uh, um, the public basically believes that monetary policy has returned to its pre-COVID standards. They're not, the public is not thinking that the Fed going forward will behave in a very different way than what they did before COVID. In other words, they are interpreting the rise of inflation between 2021 and 2022 as an occasional accommodation of inflation as opposed to a permanent change in the and weakening of the response of the central bank to inflation. And by the way, you see exactly the same for the euro area. You see this very close correspondence between the forecast generated by the model and the survey of professional forecasters. So I asked four questions. The first one was about whether the inflation experience in the US and in the euro area were similar or different. And we showed that they were very much alike. The second question was about the drivers of the recent run up which we attributed mostly to unexpectedly strong demand, possibly driven by fiscal and monetary policy, but also pent up demand. The third question was asking what would have happened if the Fed had been more aggressive against inflation. And we saw that inflation obviously would have been lower, but also the economy would have suffered in terms of economic activity. And finally, uh, going forward and looking ahead, the most important result there is that the Fed doesn't seem to have lost much credibility from this uh, unfortunate uh, high inflation uh, um, episode. I'm going to stop here and I'm happy to take many questions. Okay. So question one, this was an extremely popular question. Uh, what do you attribute the cause of the six month lag between the US and European inflation? This is an excellent question. And the honest answer is that I don't know. However, um, if you look at data before COVID, not just data on inflation, but also data on economic activity, you see usually a very strong correlation between what happens in the US and what happens in the Euro area with a little bit of a delay in the Euro area. So it's not something that we've never seen before, but in this particular episode, it's incredibly striking. It's always two quarters, whatever series you look at, except for GDP that obviously collapse in exactly the same quarter. And so, um, to be honest, I don't know what uh, what uh, what drove that. One possibility is that 
the 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 the, the constraints related to COVID uh, in various European countries lasted a little bit longer than in the U.S. Uh, but I don't know for sure whether that's uh, whether that's the case. It seems like a plausible uh, a plausible explanation. So another question we're getting is that uh, housing has been a stubborn driver of post-pandemic inflation in the U.S. Has there been a similar trend in the euro area? Um, so we need to put this a little bit into context. You mentioned housing, right? So the price of housing uh, does not... Uh, I don't think it enters directly the CPI, so the type of uh, uh, um, price index that I mentioned here, and for sure does not enter the PCE, which is the uh, personal consumption expenditure price index, uh, um, which doesn't mean that the price of houses uh, have not increased. They have, but it's not obvious what is the effect of the increase in the price of housing into these overall inflation indices. In general, my impression is that uh, the price of houses are a little bit more volatile uh, here in the US relative to Europe. When they increase, they increase more rapidly. When they collapse, they collapse more rapidly. So from that point of view, I see um, many European countries having slightly more stable house prices. Uh, uh, also, also there, obviously, they fluctuate, but a little bit less. So another question on August 2020, uh, Chairman Powell announced a more accommodating monetary policy average inflation targeting. How did this policy change impact your results and did the ECB pursue any such change? Um, the ECB, I, I, I seem to remember they they went through a revision their, of their monetary policy strategy, but the result of that revision was less uh, drastic than for the US, where in the US they officially adopted this average inflation targeting. Um, to be honest, I don't think that that had a particular uh, impact uh, on uh, the resulting uh, behavior of, uh, of inflation in the sense that probably would have happened uh, regardless. Uh, the, the, the typical reason, uh, and this is also uh, Powell that mentioned this uh, in the 2021 Jackson Hole conference, uh, the Fed and the ECB for that matter, they thought that the initial increase of inflation was temporary. So this is why they were slow in responding. They were slow in responding also because economic activity was weak, especially in Europe. So you put these two things uh, together, you think that the increase in inflation is uh, temporary, and economic activity is still not recovered to pre-COVID trend, and then rationally you decide to be cautious. The analysis that we have done is an easier analysis because we have the benefit of, uh, of having seen three additional years of data. So we have a better interpretation, well, better, better in my mind, interpretation of, uh, of history. But in real time, that was definitely the motivation for why they were cautious. Uh, they waited uh, um, quite a bit before raising rates. And I, my guess is that that would have happened also if they had not uh, moved to average inflation targeting. But obviously that's a guess. It looks like we have time for just about one more question. Um... So obviously we just had a number of elections in Europe and, and a big upcoming election in America. How do these elections uh, affect your inflation forecasts and, and do they? Um, our inflation forecast is not uh, um, affected by, by this thing. So I can think of one potentially huge effect <laughs> of uh, elections on inflation forecasting, which is uh, if the Fed were to lose some independence. And in that case, uh, you know, that's a whole new ball game and forecast of inflation probably would be much less optimistic, uh, but hopefully that will not happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
थैंक यू Thank you so much, Professor Premisari, and thank you everyone for being here. And uh, we have reception over here. Everyone is invited. <laughs>